All right. So last time we talked about value theory in general, what makes a good life good? How do we know from right from wrong? Those are issues that in the larger perspective are connected to meta ethics. And so that's why I said, don't forget what we talked about before with regards to ethics and how that's going to be related to the overall picture of ethics once we get into normative ethics. So we talked about last time we started value theory with a discussion of hedonism. And remember hedonism is saying that how you should live your life, what is constitutes good versus bad is how much happiness is produced versus misery. And remember when we talk about values, values are a particular thing in terms of maybe very different from what we're normally accustomed to when we talk about emotions. We, we say happiness is an emotion, and something you feel. That's very different from what the hedonist is talking about. As I think I mentioned before, the hedonist is talking about value in the terms of um, a goal, a virtue, something that you'll strive for. So the hedonist wants to strive for something that's uh, beyond them, something external, an achievement. Now we talked about instrumental and intrinsic values last time and how that happiness is an intrinsic value. It's something that you're striving for, you're, tr you're trying to reach and possess. Uh, and you're going to do that using instrumental goods or values, things that help you get to them. So tools or whatever will help you achieve those particular values. Now, when we talk about desire theory, on the other hand, and this is where we're going to get to today, is that remember there's a number of different problems when we talk about uh, hedonism and why happiness is the ultimate intrinsic value that we're going to base our lives on a notion of happiness as the ultimate goal. So I bring upon this uh, example again, and I know people might be tired of it, but it's a really important example. Notice in the dress sort of debate that you may have seen online, what color is this dress? Is it gold or gold and white or black and blue? There's all these debates. Uh, and what's interesting though, is that we forget that color the experience of color is a very subjective experience. Uh, what that looks like to me in my mind is something very particular that is hard or according to some philosophers impossible to communicate. So it seems everybody has their own take. And that's something that's going along the lines with what we're going to talk about today and desire theory. So desire theory is saying instead of relying on some sort of ultimate external goal, there is something that we all must do or reach to live a good life. They instead are proposing that perhaps the best life is the life that you desire for yourself based on what you want. So you kind of get to make the rules of what makes a good life. Now notice, this is really different be to hedonism. Why? Because hedonism, again, is talking about an intrinsic value, an ultimate value of happiness. And then that's when you know, once you achieve that, that you've lived a good life. Desire theory, on the other hand, is just saying, well, if you want it, then that's good enough. If you don't want happiness, then you don't have to have it. And you can still categorize yourself as living a good life. So hedonism is an objective theory of human welfare that our overall um, position or welfare in life can be determined objectively, like we are slowly getting better versus worse in the overall uh, picture of the world. Desire satisfaction theory, on the other hand, is saying, well, that 
life is completely up to you. And there isn't an objective uh, marker or way to determine whether your life is getting better or not, other than just simply your subjective uh, view on the issue. So what I try to do is communicate this in the terms of a bucket list. Uh, if you've ever heard about that term, a bucket list is a list of things or accomplishments or, or things that you want to do before you kick the bucket, before you pass away. Uh, these are these ultimate goals. You want to travel around the world. You want to go skydiving, whatever it is, it's up to you whether you accomplish what you want on that list and however that list works. So if you're happy with eating chips at home all day and that's on your list, well, great. And that's kind of what desire satisfaction theory is saying is that since there aren't any intrinsic values, there's nothing, you know, everything is merely just a tool. Um, and it's not about happiness either. I have to, that's why the big difference here is that it's not ultimately about being happy. It's just getting what you want and achieving whatever subjective goals you propose. Now, this seems really beneficial and this seems great. However, the problem is that while these, now let's go through the benefits though, that the variety of good life that, well, we have all the bases covered, that, you know, no one has to do anything they don't want to say that they live the good life or claim they live the good life. Uh, it's completely based on personal authority. You get to decide what you want and what you don't. Want. If you put skydiving on your list and then suddenly you don't want to do it <laughs> once you're up there, then that's fine. And that the idea that who knows better what's good for you than yourself. So those are the benefits. However, I'm already alluding to the problems. Is this really going to be though? this approach to life necessary and sufficient for living a good life is remember we went to the terms of necessary and sufficient in the previous lecture necessary in the terms that you must have it in your life and sufficient that's all you need in your life so getting what you want is that really necessary to live a good life and is that all you need sufficient this is where of course we get to the problem and there's many problems with this type of theory as you can kind of get a sense of already. Well, what Schaefer Landau does here in, in this chapter is that he, he's going to test it out in a way that philosophers usually test out a lot of things logically. We like to see if it's necessary and then we like to see if it's really sufficient. So how is he going to test if it's really necessary? that you get what you want, you fulfill your desires, and then that's going to be a good life. So in his, so he's going to phrase it this way in an if then statement. If something is good for you, us, then it satisfies our desire. So that seems to make sense, but how are we going to test this? How do we test an if and then statement? Well, we know that if and then statements are true in most cases except one case and that's when the consequent is false even if the antecedent is true another way of saying that is that the, the first part if the if part if that's true but the then part is false then the whole thing must be false and that's that relation of if and then so Schaefer Lama proposes then if something is good for us then it satisfies our desires but can we think of a situation a counterexample where that's not true where one doesn't fall from the other that even though the first part might be true it might be good for us it doesn't really satisfy our desires. It's not really what we want. And he names a number of examples in the book. One of the examples that's really, uh, I think, obvious and maybe helpful here is that vaccines. So we're dealing with a lot of issues regarding vaccines right now. We're looking for a vaccine for COVID. 
Uh, there's also, you know, just regular vaccines that we get for children. Would we say that's good for us? It seems pretty obvious to Schaefer Leonard. Well, yeah, in those cases, vaccines are good for us. Do they satisfy our desires though? Maybe not in all cases. If you give children a vaccine, that's probably not what they want to get pricked by a needle, right? But is it something that there's gonna be beneficial to them? Yes. So this is where he's testing out that it's not necessarily the case that if it's good for us, it's gonna be fulfilling something that we want. So that's one counter example. Now, so if it's not necessary, can it be sufficient? This is where we start testing out this kind of approach. So according to desire satisfaction theory, getting you what you want is sufficient. That's all you need in life. You may have heard that before, that sort of saying that, you know, the point of life, what, what you want in life is getting what you want. If you get what you want, you're, you're good. Well, let's test that out. Schaefer Lander proposes in using that if then structure again to test it out. If something fulfills our desires, so notice he switched it instead of the second part, now he put desires in the first part of the sentence. So if something fulfills our desires, then it's good for us. Okay, so that's true. It's something that we want, then it's gonna be good for us. But can we come up with a situation where that's not the case? Think for a second. Notice, sometimes there are things that we like or want, but aren't good for us. Uh, smoking is a good example of this. Maybe we desire to have a cigarette, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's good for us. Well, how can we, let's say, maybe uh, adjust this? How, how can the desire satisfaction theorists you know, respond to such a claim? Well, they might say, okay, if something fulfills our informed desires, i.e. based on true belief, so I'm not being this, you know, um, delusional, I'm not uh, basing my desire on a lie that I know the facts, you know, then I might change my mind and that would be good for us. But then he brings up a, a, a really, Kind of silly but easy example you know where let's say something along the lines of i'm watching tv and they're saving a well and the, they push the well back into the ocean you know uh that's based on the truth that's really happening but is it really improving my life you know uh also sports games too assuming i'm not betting on the sports game or something I just want this team to win. Does it really make my life better? Maybe not. So that's the case where even though it fulfills our form desires, it doesn't really benefit us. And that's a criticism for this version. Now, again, what would the desire satisfaction theorists say in response? They might say, well, okay, I see your point. So if something has fulfilled our informed, self-regarding desires, now it's different. Now we've turned it to a situation where I should be directly benefiting from getting what I want and that I'm informed about my decision. There's no tricks here. I'm getting, I know what I'm getting myself into and it's directly benefiting me. But this is the kicker and I, I really like this uh, objection. He refers to John McEnroe, who's a really famous tennis player. And uh, John McEnroe uh, has a really vicious temper. And if you ever look him up on YouTube or Google, you'll see that he has a notorious temper. He's, you know, assaulted people. He's yelled at people, cursed at people. Um, but despite all these character flaws, he's a really good tennis player. And he, at some point, was the best tennis player in the world. He won many championships. Uh, he had all the trophies. And he writes in his autobiography, he gets to that point, he's conquered everybody, he's, he, he's at the top, and 
So he knows what he's getting into. He got what he wanted. All his, you know, championships, everything he's been working for his entire life is on the list. And he says, well, there's something missing, though. And it didn't seem to be the best situation. He still wasn't satisfied by this. What was missing is that he said, well, he wasn't getting any pleasure from it. So what if he won all the championships? So what if he was number one? He didn't feel good about it. In other words, he wasn't happy at the end. And notice what happens in, as a response is that if he's not happy at the end, it's not really worth it. All of these instrumental goals of championships and training and endorsements, money, fame, but it didn't arrive to happiness, then it wasn't really worth it. But then this should tip you off as a, wait a minute. Okay, so if we add that aspect to it, that happiness is a key here. These, that has to be part of what makes your desire fulfilling. We lead right back into the issues of hedonism that then there is an intrinsic value that's worthwhile. What is that intrinsic value? Must be happiness. But then we saw in the previous chapter when we talked about hedonism, why happiness isn't necessary or sufficient as well. Or let me uh, rephrase that. It might be necessary, but it surely isn't sufficient. So the lesson then is that there doesn't seem to be desires itself to be fulfilling enough. So we could, there's also many other counterexamples to desire satisfaction theory, why it's not maybe the best theory to live your life by. You may die never knowing that you satisfy your desires. Uh, this is the case for many philosophers or, or famous writers is that you know, they will try to contribute to, you know, in some effort and, and write that famous book, but they may die in the process and not find out. Um, Rene Descartes is a really famous French philosopher and he wrote a lot of things that became famous and, and some of the most famous philosophy, but he never published any of that when he was alive. Impoverished desires. Impoverished desires is an important aspect as well. Is there something more? So you might get what you want, but you might be missing out and not even realize it. So did you get, you know, that favorite car you want or, or whatever you've been saving up for? And then it turns out there was a better car that was, was much more desirable, you know, maybe the same type of car, but just more features or something you had no idea. Uh, the paradox of self-harm and self-sacrifice. So you may harm yourself and maybe that's your goal or your desire, right? To harm yourself, but that doesn't seem to be making your life better. And you may sacrifice yourself. Plenty of people have sacrificed it. Maybe you save somebody's life, right? And sacrifice your own life. Clearly doesn't make your life better, right? And the fallibility for deepest desires. What about if we're wrong about what we want? A classic example of this, and it's been researched much, is people who are feeling suicidal, they're entertaining those ideas. Um, what it's found out that the people who, of course, because we can't interview the people who were successful, but the people who really did attempt a full suicide, like jumped off a bridge or something like that, and perhaps survived, when they interview them afterwards, they realize and they claim that they made a big mistake this, the second they stepped off that bridge that they thought they wanted that and then simply changed their mind, but it was too late. And it doesn't even have to be that extreme of a case, but there are plenty of cases you can think about personally where you thought you wanted something, but it turns out to be not what you wanted in the end. 
So what's the point then of, of all this that we've been talking about this past week with value theory? That getting what you want is not an essential ingredient for having a good life. And that really might be in stark contrast to the lessons and sort of tradition in our culture about, you know, what was the point of life? Well, getting what you want, achieving your goals, maybe that isn't the best life. And we went through some examples why it won't necessarily make the best life. You would say, well, ultimately then, of course, it's happiness that you want to achieve. And that's really the intrinsic value, as the hedonist would say. But as we've seen, it can't be the only intrinsic value. We saw Nozick's argument against hedonism and other sort of approaches where perhaps happiness isn't the best option all the time. Even though it can be important, there seem to be other values as well that are considered intrinsic. Autonomy, making decisions for yourself, deciding what you want to do in your life, your free will, that doesn't always bring about happiness. Uh, knowledge, knowing the truth, that may not always bring about happiness either, but that might also be just as important. And justice, and certainly there are cases where justice can be served, but doesn't make everybody happy. Uh, so those are just type, some of the type of objective values that we're gonna talk about later in the semester where they don't necessarily lead to happiness, that they are valuable in and of themselves and they are important to living a good life.